LA Metro Magazine podcast is here to bring you the entertaining, informative, and inspiring stories of the people who live, work, and play in the greater Lewis and Auburn, Maine area. I'm your host, Colby Michaud. Today, we sit down with a true champion of LA, Chip Morrison. He's a former president of the Lewis and Auburn Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce and city manager of Auburn. In this episode, the first of a two-part feature, Chip describes his early years in the Midwest and what eventually led him to Maine reflects on his role as Auburn City Manager, and details his function as the President of the Chamber. This is LA Metro Magazine Podcast, Episode 11. Chip, welcome to LA Metro Magazine Podcast. Mm -hmm. It's an honor and a privilege to speak with you. It's, it's, it's an honor to... Somebody wants to hear something from me. I think a lot of people want to hear something from you. Okay, we'll see if we can give them something. Yeah, so um, I think, at least in this area, most people probably know you as the former president of the chamber, mm -hmm. of the LA Metro chamber, but your past is uh, much more in-depth than that. Yes, it is. Can you take us back uh, to your humble beginnings? My humble In the Midwest? Be in the Midwest. I was born... Uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, when my father was stationed there during World War II. Um, and didn't live there long. The war ended six months after I, was, uh, after I was born, and he was discharged a couple of months after that. And we, we moved back to his hometown, which was Waukegan, Illinois, uh, an independent city about the size of Lewis and Auburn combined in... Uh, 40 miles north of Chicago. And I grew up there, you know, went to high school there. Uh, you know, you have a lot of roots in that community, but you know, no relatives left there. They're, they've all died, and uh, those that stayed. And uh, my folks moved away you know, when my father retired at age 65. Uh, it is interesting to me to think about my time there. I still have friends who went to high school there. I religiously go back to my five-year reunions at high school. Uh, it was a major multiracial community then. It's even more so now. Uh, played sports, uh, didn't, do much, didn't do much else in terms of activities, as it turns out. I was a, a football player. I ran track. You know, the, uh, fancied myself as a good athlete. I wasn't. Yeah. I was always second string, although I was the first string place kicker for the team. And, you know, I ran just to keep in shape for football. Yeah. Anything else would have been a good, a better avocation. But, you know, my father was a world-class world tennis player. I never played tennis because that's what he did. Um, I tried to play golf, didn't do much of that. Wasn't good at that then. I, I got better later. Um, and then went to college from there, a little school in Minnesota, Carlton College, uh, which is a school similar to Bates, small liberal arts school in the upper Midwest, in a community that had only two colleges and nothing else. You know, I should say that there was a General Mills plant there too, but the yeah, total community population was probably four or 5,000, uh, exclusive of the two colleges. Uh, in southern Minnesota, which is just south of Minneapolis, St. Paul. He uh, got a great education there, um, struggled. I mean, he's a college full of brainy people. Uh, I never considered myself one, you know. But, you know, I got through, yeah. and that was my accomplishment, you know, and it got me into going to graduate school from there. And what was the field was public administration in graduate school. I did, took some courses in business school as well. Uh, uh, didn't know what I wanted to be. I thought I wanted to be a teacher uh, and never got there, you know, because I found out this career of city manager and I, you know, applied for jobs in city management, got one. You know, you know city managers are carpetbaggers. I, you know, when we were gra graduating, I say we, my wife and I, were graduating, uh, we sent applications to... 100, the 100 largest cities in the country, you know, unsolicited. Mm -hmm. you know, this is back in the era where paper was the only way you applied yeah. for anything with a resume and had four interviews out of that. Um, you know, one was from the city of Des Moines, Iowa, where uh, the 
manager called me up and said, I want you to come for an interview. And I said, how, how'd you get, it? yeah, why me? And he said, well, I know one of your references, Dr. Arthur Bromage, who was my advisor at college. And he gave a good recommendation on you. So I went to talk to Dr. Bromage and he said, shave off your beard. <laughs> <laughs> you had a beard at the time. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, which back then was rare. Uh -huh. And uh, the, uh, and go get, go get the job. Now, the lesson of life for me in talking to people about careers and jobs is I got that interview only because two of the three assistant managers in that office resigned in the same week. And that was the week that my resume came floating in. <laughs> so they didn't advertise the job. They just called me. You know, that was almost never done then. Uh, but they were desperate. You know, this is a 2,000 person organization with a four person executive team and half of it was going away in two weeks. Yeah. So the real question was how fast can you start? And uh, they were taking my advisor's recommendation. I was there for four and a half years. Um, you know, was promoted a couple of times. You know, led the part of the organization that dealt with some of the inner city issues that they had, you know, urban renewal, model cities, a variety of things that names that people would know about from, from past, uh, you know, and was a connection to a lot of community groups in the community. That's what I did, you know. Um, and uh, would have stayed there for a long time. It's interesting, it's just like the happenstance thing. As I got to be, it was the fall of my fourth year there, you know, I'd moved up to the number two assistant because the other guy had left and taken a city manager job somewhere. And the number one assistant, big article in the newspaper, he was offered the uh, position as city administrator in St. Paul. You know, while the city manager and I were at the city manager's conference in Minneapolis. And so the boss, Tom, came up to me and said, congratulations, you're moving up to number one. Well, it turned out that he declined the job. <laughs> And at that moment, I decided, I, I knew he was gonna stay then to try to be city manager when Tom retired. Mm -hmm. and, and actually became that. Mm -hmm. um, and I started applying for city manager jobs all over the country. Um, had interviews in a bunch of places. Back then, there were no city managers in the country that were under age 30, uh, and I was 20-something. And uh, got, interview, got an interview mm -hmm. in a darkened room in Bowling Green, Kentucky, where they, back in the room, it was a bar. Uh, and the, one of the counselors, had, they told me going in that we have to be unanimous on whoever we select. Yeah, I said, okay, so we had a nice conversation. And then at the end of the interview, one of them looks at me and says, what, do you, what are you gonna do about your handicap? He wasn't talking about golf, because we hadn't talked about golf. <laughs> and I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, well, you're too young for this job. <laughs> Today would be an illegal question, probably. Right. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Your handicap. And, 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 and we talked about it, and I knew then I wasn't going to get that job. Uh, the, uh, I kept applying, and a couple of months later, you know, you know, got an interview at a small community in Michigan, Benton Harbor. Um, and I get there, it, you know, I've done some research, but again, there's no internet, so research is hard. You know, you're really doing hard research in, you know, city of 20,000 isn't gonna have a lot of references in the Des Moines Library. So I get there, and I've got some indication on it, and I called some people in the community. Turns out the community is 95% black. Um, and and I said, so why are you interviewing me and you're not interviewing a black candidate? And they said, well, we thought you were black. And they said, what possibly got you that indication? He says, all the programs that you were working on here relate to inner city issues. Hmm. Is it? Um, and you know, they hired me um, on a 5-2 vote, uh, <laughs> which was kind of prophetic in a way. Um, the real reason the mayor wanted me was because he thought he could control me. 
and I would do what he wanted. And immediately he wanted me to sign some travel shit for him to go somewhere <laughs> uh, that wasn't in the budget. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, you can't do that. Stress is an inevitable part of life. Learning how to manage stress takes practice. Not only is it possible, it is necessary. Hi, I'm Nicole, Association Director of Health, Wellness, and Fitness from the YMCA of Auburn Lewiston. Here are a few ways to help you deal with stress. Exercise regularly. It's one of the best ways to relax your body and mind and improve your mood. When you're stressed, your muscles get tense. Loosen them up by stretching, enjoying a massage, and getting a good night's sleep. Eating a regular, well-balanced diet will help control your moods and make you feel better overall. Life is busy, hectic, and too fast-paced. Sometimes we just need to slow down and chill out. Plan and schedule time for meditation, yoga, tai chi, listen to music, or spending time outside. Remember that you can't control everything. Do yourself a favor and stop thinking you must do it all. Keep a positive attitude and your sense of humor. Laughter goes a long way. For more health and wellness tips and to learn more about the YMCA of Auburn Lewiston, visit us online at alymca.org or stop by and see us. I was just going to ask, you got offered po both, B both jobs, both same time. cities. Did you know anything about Auburn, Maine before you no, had applied? No, or? but through the city manager network, you can get some information. Um, and, uh, you know, in the interview process, uh, Jane and I came up here and spent three days. And I just went business to business, stood on the street corner and talked to people, and went to places that uh, members of city council didn't even know about. <laughs> do you rem remember any of those places? Oh, yeah, I do. Thoughts? The one that really impressed them, um, let me get this right. East Waterman Road comes off of center, uh, off of Route 4, up in, you know, uh, and goes down to the river. Yep. Actually, there's a little boat launch down there, which I use every once in a while for kayaking. Uh, and I talked to him about how beautiful that spot was. And I guarantee you that not one of them knew where that spot was. Mm. Um, <laughs> I don't think that would be true today. But, but the river was an unused resource then, mm -hmm. uh, and a pretty smelly one at, the, at, at best. Um, but I thought, what a beautiful place. And I chose Auburn because, you know, it was an independent city. It had all of the aspects of a bigger place, but, it was, you know, smaller population. And, uh, you know, my goal then was to start in one city and move to a more populous city later. And, you know, I, but with the promise that we would stay here till our kids got out of public school. Well, either they're the dumbest kids on earth because we're here 43 years later, <laughs> or we found a place we really loved and we never moved. Yeah. And we're still in the same house we moved into 43 years ago. Wow. Um, the, uh, and as you saw it, you saw the backyard. It's a wonderful place, you know, right in the middle of the city. Our kids walked to every school but Walton. They walked to the middle school, they, you know, you know, they walked to the high school, they walked to Lake Street School, they walked to, to Webster School but they had the bus to bust to Walton for one year, which was ninth grade for them. Um, and uh, it was a great place for them to grow up. Yeah. Uh, they, got, they got a, what I believe was a first class public education uh, that enabled them both to go to very excellent post-secondary opportunities. You know. And they took advantage of them. You know, they went to very highly rated schools and they got into the careers they wanted. So, you know, the education, ed, Auburn education system really panned out for them very, very well. Um, as a family, you know, we did some things together, uh, primarily, you know, community little theater. You know, the, there's a great story that goes with that because we have friends, a guy was, you know, city administrator in Allentown, Pennsylvania, owned a dinner theater. And we went to visit them on one weekend. And, and they were putting on Sound of Music. And we got back here, and Little Theater was auditioning for Sound of Music. Our kids saw it in the paper and said, we want to audition for that. 
but we won't audition unless you audition. <laughs> so we all auditioned. Um, we didn't all get in, uh, as it turns out. Uh, my wife and I got in, and our son got in. Our daughter, whose lifetime career is the arts, was the only one who didn't get in. And I think at that moment, she said, I'll prove them all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And now she owns her own production business. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's it. So it's, uh, and that got us big time involved in the community. Mm. Um, and so, about what time was that? What, what year that was, was that? It was 1978 when we came here. 70, yeah, so it's, yeah. So 1978, you arrived in Auburn, Maine. Auburn, Auburn and Maine. We arrived in June of 1978. I started work in July of 1978 um, and worked for the city for nine years, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, we did lots of things. Yeah, did the first major uh, development project, housing development project, um, which was the Roke Block and, uh, at the time. Uh, and huge opposition in the community to that project. You, know, you cannot find anyone today think that's a bad idea. Right. <laughs> um, but we used some very unusual things. We, you know, the Broke Block, which many people don't know, is a series of buildings next to one another. You think it's one big building, but it's not. And we had to buy property from a bunch of owners and a couple of, and there was not, no, nothing in it. There were you know, a couple of Main Street level businesses, but other than that, there was a lot of pigeon dung in the upper floors, yeah. and a couple of the owners didn't want to sell, mm-hmm. you know, and we had to use eminent domain to get those properties, and it was a real public outcry. Yeah. Um, the city councilors who have to vote that were very brave people because their friends and neighbors were telling them, you're taking somebody's property. We'd offered them more than a fair price, so I just, I don't feel badly about that. They got more than the, what the properties were worth, um, but we couldn't have done the project. What they, it was, was kind of like a robbery that they wanted to get. If the city wants it, we're going to get whatever we can get. Well, the you you know, city can't pay more than what a property is actually worth, and you can jiggle that a little bit, but not what they wanted. Uh, so the city council and the mayor led that, and a couple of people who were absolutely against eminent domain voted for it because they knew otherwise they're going to have to tear that building down eventually. Uh, there were lots of other projects. We had lots of fun doing that. We built the first trash plant in Auburn. Um, did a lot. You know, the council and staff did a wonderful job looking at the alternatives. Yeah, didn't turn. Yeah, the first plant didn't turn out so well, but people who built it kind of build a low budget thing <laughs> it didn't it didn't work the current one works very well um you know which brought in work with other communities because we wanted to get other communities trash you can't run a trash plant if you don't have enough fuel <laughs> right um uh, what municipal government teaches you is all the things that nobody really knows about until something goes wrong whether it's landfills or you know sewer systems or whatever you know you get to learn all that stuff uh, because that's what makes cities tick if you will or run properly and nobody notices until they're not working anymore yeah. uh, uh, but you know government was different then people trusted their government officials you know, well we had contentious meetings do you remember the urban thing and using eminent domain was one of those there were very few. Uh, and the whole council, while they were sometimes split on issues, always got it done. There would be dissenting votes, um, but there was no angry rhetoric at one another. It was just a different era in public discourse than what we see today at any level. And I, um, uh, and municipalities still do that better than anybody else does. Mm-hmm. I really believe that. I mean, re- the only government that works really well is a local government because they do what people need, whether it's putting out fires at people's houses or, you know, y- you know, mediating domestic disturbances, <laughs> uh, which is a nice way to say when somebody's beating somebody up, you can go take care of them, um, or providing welfare benefits or, you know, you know some health programs 
taking care of the streets, taking care of the schools. That's what people need to live. Right. And that's what municipal government's all about. Uh, loved it then. Uh, probably would st still have been city manager of Auburn today. Um, but for uh, in probably December of 1986, the governor called me and said, would you consider being commissioner of the state's department of administration? This is the governor himself. <laughs> and I said, actually it wasn't, it was his chief of staff and then the governor. He said, he said what does he do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew about the Department of Transportation. I'd had big fights with the Department of Environmental Protection over, you know, licensing of our trash plant and a grant program that they put out for solid waste. But that was really my touch with state government. Uh, and he said, well, it runs the internal operations of the government. You've got purchasing and you've got personnel, everything but finance. Finance was a separate department all by itself. Uh, and I said... Okay, I guess I'll try it, but let me let's have a little discussion about this. He said, "You know, I'm not a Republican." He says, "I know you're an independent." And I said, "Yeah, okay, and that's okay. I don't have to register in a party for this." He said, "No." Uh, and he said, and then secondly, how did you get my name? I knew him. This is Jack McKernan. I knew him, but yeah, you know, he was a member. Previously, been a member of the you know, congressional delegation as the representative from the first district, actually. Uh, his future wife was a representative from the second district. So, it, so uh, And he said, well, my mother recommended you. <laughs> she followed me as president of the Maine Municipal Association. Huh. <laughs> and we were good friends, you know, Barbara and I, and did a lot of things together. Uh, I can't help but think that probably he'd offered the job to have two or three private sector people, and they wouldn't take him for the salary he was willing to pay. But he never said that to me. Mm. Uh, the, and I've never approached that way. That we're friends. And uh, uh, I spent you know, almost all of his two terms working there, first in the Department of Administration. And then when John Fitzsimmons went to the community college system, he called me and says, you want to be commissioner of labor? And I said, that'll be tough. This is a re-election year. People are going to beat me up and beat you up because, you know, that's just not my background. And he said, you've had lots of experience. You've done negotiated the state employee contracts and actually it was part of my department. Oh, uh, it was contentious. <laughs> um, the committee who was, heard my confirmation uh, speech and asked questions uh, voted me down. Uh, and it was overturned by the Senate. You know, one or two people in the history of Maine that happened to. Now, I knew that was going to happen because my own senator, who was then John Cleveland, um, uh, was, you know, said, you don't have to worry about this. You will be confirmed. <laughs> um, it was just, you know, Democrats trying to take a stand against a Republican governor who was running in a very tight race. Mm -hmm. He won by less than... Two percent, mm -hmm. two tenths of a percent of the vote, something wow. like that, and it was really close. Um, and so I went to the labor department just when the state went into recession in 1981, and you know, in some ways bigger than any recession the state has had, you know, in terms of job loss. Uh, and it was it was a very it was very needed work, and you know, so much respect for people who worked in the labor department because. You know, we were, you know, government was laying off people because of the recession, because we didn't have any money. Uh, and these folks worked extra hours, no pay. They were in on weekends. You know, I was up there in my job. I even mean, no technical ability. A lot of this stuff done by computer. I just brought them coffee on Saturday morning or something. <laughs> yeah, uh, and talked to them and said, thank you for doing this. Uh, it's hard work yeah. uh, and unappreciated work. Uh, very different system. And the whole... It, Unemployment system is electronic now. You file on you file online. You get approved online. Yep. Then it required a personal interview. I mean, so we really worked hard to expedite everything because it was people need their unemployment. If they can't find a job, no matter how hard you work, you need support. Um, 
And just before he, his term was over, um, the, uh, I decided I just wanted to do something different. You know, I, th I thought maybe I could stay at the, probably a, uh, with a new governor. I knew all the people running for governor at the time. Um, but then it, yeah, I, I got a job in the private sector working for uh, an investment company. Became a registered investment advisor, um, you know, selling retirement plans to municipalities, principally some states, um, a few nonprofits. Uh, it, we did really well. I mean, the company, you know, in my region, you know, sold a billion dollar plan uh, to, uh, to Pontiac, the, the county in which Pontiac, Michigan is in. And, and you know, shortly thereafter, you know, the company restructured a little. They asked me to move to Michigan because that's where the biggest piece of our business was. And I said, no, I'm doing this fine from Auburn, Maine, and that's where I want to stay. I know where my home is. Yeah, uh, had a little office on the sixth floor of Two Great Falls Plaza. Oh, yeah? Yeah, look, you know, not looking over the river the other side. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Uh, that was, you know, so I was, you know, they, you know, they paid me a fair amount of money so I wouldn't hire on with some other firm and compete with them, uh, well, for which I was grateful. And that the chamber job came up at the exact same time. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I had been on the chamber board for the, all the time I was city manager. You know, the city managers are ex-officio members of the chamber board. Um, and the three, there were four finalists. I knew all of the other three. I really thought that one of the others was a better choice, um, but they chose me. Um, and uh, so I spent 20 years here in this room. Yeah, not in this room because we were in a different location down, down at 179 Lisbon Street and worked with the Growth Council to redevelop this building as, a, as the business service center for the community. Yeah. Uh, a very rewarding, um, very rewarding piece of piece of work, as it turns out. But we had to be convinced. I wasn't convinced. I mean, you know, the city called me and the growth council called me and said, "We really want you to consider moving the chamber down here." We were in a very comfortable lease in a very small space, but we didn't pay very much. <laughs> and I looked at the at the price tag and said, "Hmm." You know, that could be a big debt, or we could do a capital campaign. And you know, yeah. look at the column out in the lobby, we did a capital campaign. <laughs> we needed $500,000, we got 600, um, and we equipped everything. And, you know, the chamber moved into this space, owns the floor that the chamber's in, uh, debt free. Um, and that's a good asset for a chamber yeah. to have. Yeah. Clearly, it costs money to be in this kind of space and upkeep and all of that, but it's you know basically what rent was back then is what chamber pays today, you know in terms of being in the space. Yeah. So it's well, a, so what was the the internal and maybe external deliberation going on to decide whether well, to do the capital campaign or to stay in that space? I, well, you know, we knew the board and I talked about it. And we knew that. To just borrow money for our would leave us with a big mortgage that would be a, would, that could become an elbow cross if, you know, cyclically there's a downturn and you, you a decrease in membership. Um, so we said we need to do this, and our internal goal was to get at least two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and take a mortgage. The spoken goal was five hundred thousand, and our members responded incredibly well. There. Some, there's some real heroes in this. Mm -hmm. A very low-ranked assistant vice president in one of the local banks, you know, nagged the president of the bank incessantly, and they are the organization for which the building is named. And they put in $100,000. You know, the, the uh, you know, the theory in fundraising is you've got to have, for half a million, you have to have three contributions that are going to net you 200000 to make five. 
and then the rest you could get in $5,000 increments. Yeah. First member I went to said, you know, I sat down at his desk and he wrote me a check for $5,000 and said, now all you have to do is get 99 more of those and you make your goal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd been trained better than that. I mean, you know, Barbara Trafton, who's a key fundraiser, trained me. He says, you, you can't live with that because there's not going to be 99 more of those. Um, and <laughs> so we moved here. And it's been a great space for the chamber. Uh, it was good for the Southern Gateway in terms of need, they needed anchors down here, mm-hmm. and they got them. Uh, so it's one of the, one of the things, there are lots of things that I look back on the chamber and say, geez, that was great. I mean, that starting of the Young Professionals Organization, which was, you know, started as Y Play and is now Uplift, um, was just rewarding in every single way. You know, um, it's hard because people continually age out of that <laughs> that demographic, and they are a transient group by nature. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, you know, they change jobs frequently, they move frequently. Mm-hmm. So keeping that together is a tribute to the young professionals of this community and a tribute to the Chamber for staying with it. You know, because it would, it, in some ways it would be easy to say, that's just too much hard work. Um, that's really not looking at the future the way you want it to be. Do you remember when Y Play was founded? <sighs> we were in this building. Um, so it would have been, I, I started here in 95, so it would have been around 2002 or three, something like that. Okay. That's just a guess. Yeah. Um, there are all kinds of memories from this. Yeah, you know, the chamber gave me wonderful memories. Every week was a me- every week every month was a memory when we had a board meeting, which were just fun. Yeah, you know, you know, having the you know representatives of all the major organizations in the in the community and and about half of, and half small businesses always had a lively discussion about something. You know, always except once, you know, came to agreement with, without even voting. I mean, they voted every once in a while because it has to be in the minutes, but the fact of the matter is they worked through problems. Um, and we had one issue that was very contentious, and I'm not going to talk about that. They didn't come to, you know, but I'm fine with that. I mean, the people said, are you all right? We didn't do what you wanted to do. I said, you're the board of directors. That's what, you, that's what you're supposed to do, you know, you know. Um, give guidance, and while I thought what I proposed was right, I'm over it, <laughs> yeah. and let's move on. Um, and working with the people in this committee, going, you know, you, know, you know, if you go back to when I started with the chamber, I can remember it, because the uh, I looked at the board. This was in a very small conference room in 179, and all the board couldn't sit around the same table. They were in two rows. It was somewhere against the wall and somewhere around the table. And I looked at him and I said, now, what is your real goal for the chamber? And they looked at me. The, the chair was, uh, uh, was Ray Martell of Spillers. And he said, we want to be 1,000 members. At the time, they were 640, something like that, and uh, something in that neighborhood. And, and then they all started to laugh. Turns out they'd been at that same number for 15 years before that. Mm-hmm. Um, and seven or eight years later, we passed 1,000, and eventually we got as high as 1,400. Um, the, uh, the chamber is a relevant organization for the community. Uh, I believe in it. I mean, it clearly, I think the world of Shanna, I think she's doing an incredible job. You know, I'm an active volunteer still because I believe the work they do is important to the growth of the community, the change in the community. Uh, And very happy to assist in any way I can as a volunteer. And that's what I do. Yeah, I volunteer for other organizations other than the chamber, but this is one of my, it's the love of my life, and I'll continue to volunteer here. Yeah. My thanks to Chip for his time and reflection. It's no doubt his contributions have made a positive and impactful difference for Lewiston Auburn. Stay tuned for the second part of our conversation with Chip coming up in a future episode.
A big shout out to the YMCA of Auburn Lewiston for sponsoring this program. You can find out more about them at alymca.org. We have many more exciting guests ahead, so make sure you subscribe to this podcast. That way you're not missing out on future episodes when they are released. We also want to thank you for listening. You, our audience, is the most important piece of this program. And we know that these recordings are just slices of a bigger ongoing conversation that we want you to be a part of. If you have any thoughts or ideas, please let us know on social media. LA Metro Magazine is on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Connect with us there. Positive vibes and well wishes from all of us at LA Metro Magazine. Until next time, I'm your host, Colby Michaud. Make sure you're being entertained, staying informed, and getting inspired.